his books and his internet presence. His books include Echo, Unbroken Truth Worth Repeating, and Without Flesh, Why American Christianity is Dying Even Though Jesus is Alive. His internet projects include his YouTube channel, The Sons of Solomon Men's Prayer Movement, a podcast entitled A Brief History of Power, Stop the White Noise, a show regarding Christian marriage, parenting, and more, which he produces with his wife, Meredith. I'm going to have to uh, check that one out, see how that goes. And also uh, producing uh, material for the Hebrew Collegium. He is presenting today on a sincere faith. Please join me in welcoming the Reverend Jonathan Fisk. Thank you. I am uh, honored to be here. I spoke at the ACELC, I think, in its inaugural year at its, uh, uh, the banquet, the evening, last night's banquet, back when I was in Philadelphia. I'm honored to be given the opportunity today. I'd like to begin just by reading you Psalm 44. It is in your pew Bible, but I'll be using the uh, New King James Version up here. We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in days of old. You drove out the nations with your hand, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples and cast them out. For they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance, because you favored them. You are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your name, we will trample those who rise up against us. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me, but you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. But you have cast us off and put us to shame. You do not go out with our armies. You make us turn back from the enemy, and those who hate us have taken spoil for themselves." You have given us up like sheep intended for food and scattered us among the nations. You sell your people for next to nothing and are not enriched by selling them. You make us a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and a derision to those all around us. You make us a byword among the nations, a shaking of the head among the peoples. My dishonor is continually before me. And the shame of my face has covered me because of the voice of him who reproaches and accuses, because of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way, but you have severely broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God, or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake! Why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise! Do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our body clings to the ground. Arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. In the name of Jesus, amen. I have the, uh, I don't think, enviable uh, task of talking to you today about integrity. Sincere faith is what Paul says. I could spend a lot of time explaining to you the word studies I did on uh, on upakrito, which is that word there, sincere, 
and it's kind of cool. You know, on is like the marker of against. It's like an alpha privative in this word. Uh, and then hupa means to be like agency or cause. And then krites, this is the word for judgment, right? So against caused judgment. Uh, don't do that to your soul. <laughs> yeah, don't go against what you think is right. That's what it means to be sincere. And the fact that it's on hypocrite, like not a hypocrite, don't be a hypocrite, that's pretty cool. We could spend a lot of time on that, I think. But I got stuck going deeper because I've discovered Hebrew in the last three years. I think all laity should teach themselves Hebrew, by the way. Uh, this word that I discovered in Hebrew a few weeks after I was asked to speak about sincerity is a word called tom, and it shows up all over the Old Testament, and it's the same idea, but it's a Hebraic idea. Greek narrows things down, very specific ideas. Hebrew's about the big color and how things hang together, and this word tom, translated often as integrity, sometimes as perfect, sometimes as blameless throughout the Old Testament, is a key word about what it means to walk as a Christian. You're going to be tome. You're going to be whole. You're going to be complete. You're going to have integrity. And I, again, could spend a lot of time today talking about how this is the blamelessness of Noah. Integrity is tome, the blamelessness of Noah. This is the righteousness of Job, tome. This is the goodness of the Garden of Eden. It's called tom. This is the truthfulness of Elihu. He speaks tom things. And indeed, Psalm 78, the praise of David, is tom. On and on, this word exists throughout the Old Testament as the idea of something being what it's supposed to be. It is finished. It is tom. I give you integrity, he says on that cross. But here's the thing about everything I just said. I can't give you integrity by talking about integrity. I can't. It doesn't work that way. A, a paper on integrity will not create integrity. It's not going to happen. Rather, I have to talk about things that are integral to our lives, the things about which we may, in fact, be hypocritical, both as individual Americans, as individual Christians, as individual Lutherans, as individual pastors, as congregations, as the ACELC, as the LCMS, as Christianity in America, as the Catholic Church on the Worth, on and on. There are many issues we are just not talking about, I think. One of them we all know, and some of us talk in corners, but the rest of us are afraid to say anything to anybody else, and that's the fact. The traumatic events of 2020 cannot be underestimated in their long-term impact on how our lives are never going back to the way they were before 2019. The old fights that we had in the Missouri Synod, for which the ACELC is here to help us try to resolve, prove themselves to be not actual fault lines as we faced a government system telling churches what to do with their religion. We split along completely different lines during that year, and now what I hear largely is, let's all forgive and forget and move on, which tells me we're not ready for the next time any foreign power decides to tell us as Christians what to do with our word and sacrament. So to me, uh, what I want most in our integrity is to remember that the enemy is not sleeping, and it's not Joe Biden, and it's not the WEF. And it's not anybody who ran for office in the Missouri Senate. The enemy is the devil, the diabolical dragon, the, the chief liar of lies who has not ceased at all in his prowling deception to convince us that the church is not going to win. He paints a nice picture in a big story. What we need to do first is just remember it's a state religion and that's not a new thing. These have been around for a long time. We're just not used to thinking of the United States of America, God bless America, as a state religion that's targeting anti-Christian things. But it is now. It is. People worship America rather than Jesus Christ. And those who do will do whatever they're told to do by whichever one of the two prophets they've put up to tell them what to do. One which is driving the direction of the country, the other one that's saying, just do it slower. Just do it slower. But we're going that direction all the time. So if you've, if you've learned anything, I hope you've realized that this was never about COVID. 
It was never about COVID. This has always been about the demonic haters of Jesus Christ who have learned how to regulatory capture nation-state systems on behalf of their global financial interests. That is, the worshipers of mammon know what they're doing. They're wise, and they've been doing it a long time. And they'll be happy to throw the plebs democracy in Packers games as long as you ignore what they're doing with your dollar overseas. But that's what's changing now. The internet has given people the ability to educate themselves and they're able to find out more things. And so we found for the first time in 2020, we didn't have a united narrative anywhere. There's no unifying story anywhere. And thanks be to God, because we were all on the narrative, America's great, let's make it great again. Rather than America is one more form of the Roman beast, which will forever be against the church, and we are to call it out in repentance and prophetic truth all the time. And if we can get an emperor in charge, we should tell him what to do. Because he should stop people from killing people, he should stop people from stealing, all the stuff David says, second table, absolutely, that's the sword. The sword right now, though, is not your Second Amendment firearms. It's really the news cycle. We are in a form of warfare that if you want to study warfare, it's called fifth generation warfare. And you've probably heard it said more like psyops. If you haven't, psychological operations. The idea of psychological operations used as a tool by the CIA in foreign countries going back to the 60s and before is you try to create a story in the people that causes them to divide. You make that people lose whatever social cohesion they had by the infiltration of various news. And it doesn't really matter what it is as long as you divide them. It's going to be divide them over what they're already divided on, probably. But the more that the society has no cohesion, then the individuals lack meaning with each other, which leads to a free-floating anxiety amongst all of the people, which leads to a free-floating frustration, which leads to increased aggression among people who have no self-control. And why would you think pagans who told their monkeys from the times they're babies would have any self-control? Any self-control. So they are, they are, who are they? The demons are intentionally brainwashing our civilization with an anti-Christian passionate zeal to do whatever they feel like. Meanwhile, they are controlling the story. They told you right away. Did you know Gideon Litchfield, MIT, March, March 2020, we're not going back to normal. Quote, we will restore safety by discriminating legally against those who are at risk. Temperature scanners everywhere. Your workplace will demand proof of immunity. An ID showing you've been vaccinated against the latest strains. MIT, March 2020. Speaking that publicly. None of this should have surprised us. The reason it surprises us is because we're so busy arguing about stuff nobody cares about. And we're not listening to what they're talking about. We don't realize what idolatry really is anymore. We don't even see it anymore. Uh, try to come back to that. Just for the sake of uh, YouTube, maybe giving a warning strike to the church's uh, stream here, uh, COVID-19, by the way, uh, is a blood disease that affects vascular linings, including, and importantly, the lungs. So what COVID really is about is about blood uh, uh, coagulation and the inability of blood to do what it's supposed to do, which is why ventilators are a really bad idea. Ventilators are a bad idea anyway, generally, uh, but there's research out there and lawsuits now to show how paying a hospital $30,000 for every ventilator COVID patient encourages them to put people on ventilators and keep them there even if it's bad for them. Uh, those kinds of things are going on under our noses all around us. The medical theater is evident. I've got doctors wearing masks. It's pretty easy to see that not breathing oxygen and breathing from the same mask all day long increases germs in your face and is not good for you, especially not for your children. They show things now with children with malformed lips and the inability to smile. This is demonic, and how can we not see that? How can we not see that, is the question, really. And we didn't, did we? I didn't. I put masks on. I walked around afraid, too. I'm not saying I want to point a finger at anyone. What I want is for us to not be taken again by stories told by pagans. It's that simple. If the pagans are like, the sky is falling, I'm going to be like, okay, maybe. Huh? The Bible says the sky is falling, I'm going to say the sky is falling. And that's the key here. One more thing. This is a nice test. I want a show of hands. How many of you heard of, ever, the Great Barrington Declaration? Give me hands. It's 
pretty good numbers here. I'd call that 40 to 50% of the room. That's better than other places where I've asked that question. The Great Barrington Declaration was a statement made by PhDs from Oxford, Harvard, and Stanford, all against the, uh, the inoculation campaigns and the, the con standard approach of uh, uh, lockdowns and masks and all this stuff. They made this in the spring of 2020, but the BBC Trusted News Initiative, an official BBC international program, made sure it didn't get on any news station anywhere, and it got slandered out of existence before it even started. Thankfully, some individuals like Robert Malone and others, uh, I can't forget the other doctor's name, continued to push on, and much of the information got out. But isn't it interesting that in the spring of 2020, when there were Christians and people of goodwill trying to say, slow down, we're not sure, that news just never got out because they decided you didn't get to have it, Missouri Synod. Missouri Synod doesn't get to make its own decisions. It has to make decisions based upon what it's allowed to see by the powers that be. And if we don't repent of thinking that's okay, that's, that's my thing for you today. We've got to tell our own story and, and fast. To ignore the fact that our government on multiple levels engaged in active blocking of informed consent is a moral issue that you cannot appeal by appealing to, you cannot uh, prove by appealing to Romans 13. Romans 13 does not say the government is allowed to torture you. It doesn't say that. You're allowed to run away. The theology of self-defense is well established in the Lutheran church. It shouldn't even be a question for us. The, on the other side, this is a fact, the unavoidable brave new world that we have entered into as the Christian church cannot be a place where Christian churches assume our neighbors are going to want us there or that we can even afford to be there. Our future existence cannot be taken for granted deo humano. Okay. Now, Deo Valente, I'm going to get there. In God's sight, it absolutely must be taken for granted. We're not going anywhere. But in terms of this neighborhood and that neighborhood and our prayers, we must assume that we may not be here without God's help. And left to ourselves, we will not be here. So again, instead of trying to fix it all, one of my big questions is, why aren't we just asking more? Ask more. Look at your neighborhood. America is a suburban wasteland filled with morbid obesity, drug addiction, and peasant victim-mindedness. People are willfully subjecting themselves to economic, political, and psychological warfare. And what is surely coming is already a civil war of psychological operations, decentralizing everything and yet trying to stop it. So you see a battle between new powers that are able to say, we get a piece of that big pie that no one else could have before, but they've gotten so big, hello Google, uh, that the old powers, you know, the, the bank of the world, right, they're in a tug of war for who really gets to be the empire of the next generation up, down, and, and we're stuck in the middle. In all of this, it, it also amazed me to discover that uh, the manifesto written uh, on boundary foundation and curvilinear convergence as applied to mathematics and political philosophy by Theodore Kaczynski. And if you missed all that, that's okay. It's the, it's the, it's the content that matters more than the name of the guy. Um, but he talks about how uh, what we're experiencing here is just modernism. This is just what modernism has to be. Industrial world is an endless rising complexity, an increased attempt to centralize while fighting against centralization, the siloing of truth, that is, specialization, so let's say your doctor doesn't even know a mask is bad for you to breathe through all day, right? Uh, an increasing alienation from others as you drive to work rather than work with your neighbors. Uh, a traumatization of the children by distance from their parents and a lack of security and safety leading to things like depression and, uh, and violent actions arising out of what otherwise were mostly peaceful places. All this is to say, Theodore Kaczynski's thesis that modernism is incredibly fragile. And so if you took nothing else from when I started talking about 2020, let me say it proved we are incredibly fragile as a church. The LCMS is not the big beast we want to think we are, and we're just a hop, step, and a jump away from being very irrelevant, I think, to God and being spit out for lukewarmness. We've bought the lie within the lie within the lie, which is the Gnostic lie that our bodies aren't real, that they don't matter. And you're going to raise your hand and say, but I know that, Pastor. I reject that. Yes, but you don't live like you know that. 
You live like your body is one thing and your spirit's a different thing. And again, the proof that this is the religion right now is that our government just decided to dictate to everybody what they put in their body by inoculation. We have then already set in place the ruts for the surrender of individual bodily autonomy in Western civilization, in which the vulnerable now must no longer protect himself, but rather we harm the invulnerable to protect the vulnerable. That's why 18-year-old football players and soccer players are having heart attacks. Randomly, died suddenly, you know, and all this. Um, We've gone from a a freedom civilization where we had people calling for papers. We didn't get there. They didn't get the vaccine um, uh, 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 passport quite here, but they were calling for it. And the UN is still talking about it. Papers, please, right? I grew up in the 80s. Russia was bad, I thought. But see, communism is just Gnosticism. It really is. I'm not going to go into detail, but look that one up and think on it. It's just Gnosticism, and Gnosticism is just the devil telling you there's a secret you don't know, and he's got it. So follow him, and you can do it. Backtracking a little bit here. Out of the um, uh, events at Nuremberg, the trials that involved the Nazi war criminals, and including you know, officers who were dealing with uh, Auschwitz and things like that, um, there are two main like, virtue ideas that Western civilization took out of that as uh, common to international law, which we really have to believe are no longer part of international law, but we should think they should be again. Uh, uh, and that is this. One is that, this is out of the, the Nazis did this, and we said it's wrong. It's wrong to coerce medical treatment. Nuremberg. Nuremberg. We just did it for like a year and a half as a country, right? It is wrong. to co- we, we killed Nazis for this. Like put them to, to, uh, to death, right? And yet our whole country just rolled with it. Coerced medical treatment. Uh, it is also morally wrong to obey an immoral order. That's Nuremberg too. Because that's what the Nazis said. They said, my boss told me to do it. You know how much I heard that from the LCMS and his contingent parties throughout these two years? Well, we're just doing what the authorities tell us to do. It is morally wrong to obey an immoral order. If someone tells you to kill your wife, put a bullet in the back of her head so that you can live, you don't do it. You die instead. It's that easy. right? It should be that easy. Wisdom isn't that hard. It's it's modern thought that's complex and crazy. The ominous centralization of power by these men who are proven to be dishonest, I'm talking about the government, is not something we can shrug at as the church. We just can't. In God we trust, not ours, not our God. So to veil to believe that professionally financed propaganda campaigns that widely deceive the public will have drastic consequences to faith and morals is a perilous abandonment of our prophetic character. If we can't see that the television is going to continue to brainwash people out of Lutheranism, then we're just not going to have Lutheranism anymore. It's not just about TV bad, not TV good. It's about storyline and how much any one storyline is telling you what you're doing today. And if someone listens to me for 15 minutes a week and then to the TV for 40 hours, they're going to do what the TV says. It's just humanity. We're not that strong. We all think we are. We're not. We're herd animals. Uh, Our problem, though, then, is that we've hoped too much in our capacity as individual men to resist the messages of the talking boxes and the other streaming systems. Before the TV, it was the newspaper. So it's not really a new thing. Before it was the newspaper, it was the statue of a golden cow. It's not a new thing, this idolatry. But it has made us atrophy. I heard Jordan Peterson, a pagan, saying that modern theology has lost its imagination, and I completely agree with him. He says the Christians don't talk like they believe it. You got got a pagan begging us to talk like we believe it, and we're kind of afraid to for some reason. Why is that? Uh, Well, partially because I think we still assume that the pagans in America are better pagans than the pagans in China, and so the pagans in America are going to rule with the benevolent spirit and do the right thing at the end of the day. Because after all, secularism is just the separation of church and state, right? Or is secular the Latin word for the more English worldly? So to think that worldliness will be a neutral character in government, in the church, or otherwise, is folly to anyone who knows the language. 
It's the problem with English, though. It's a complex language. It divides, and so therefore, therefore it clarifies, like for science, like I want to know what H2O is, right? But if I want to understand, like, cosmology and the waters above the sky, well, I'm a little out of luck because I've made too narrow a definition of water. Uh, uh, we must recognize, then, that the worldly narrative of symbols in English is intentionally de-Christianizing the language, and we will take action to, get, to bring that language back. Um, I'll try to get toward that toward the end here. Um, but one more bit here, and I, I'm going to take this whole next section. This is a guy from name, named, uh, um, I think it's Hasim Nawaz. Uh, he was a BBC broadcaster. He took a vaccine. He was then uh, decided he didn't want to get the booster. He got fired, and now he runs a thing called Radical, uh, where he is a, uh, a free press, independent, watch the beast kind of guy. Uh, real fascinating story. As a young man, he was a jihadist, spent time in like a jail in uh, one of the Middle Eastern countries he tried to overthrow, found the light of Western free speech, uh, and now is an activist for it. Um, I'm saying all this about him because I'm almost quoting him here from an interview he did with Joe Rogan. Uh, he says, whoever tries to shut your debate down tells you right then they're not your friend or on your side. Anybody who's your friend or is on your side will let you have a debate. They will want the best possible answer. If they already have a fixed agenda, they will shut the debate down. They are, they are beholden to an ideal rather than to truth, right? Uh, uh, are they acting in good faith? Then no, they're not. So when you have elites saying, we are the science, for example, right? Uh, they're, they're betraying something to you, which they don't have any science at all. They have no arguments. Who is the one? Robert Kennedy? Anybody? Robert Kennedy running for president? I, I, don't, I can't believe I would vote Democrat. But, but it's, he, he talks like an, a human being, which is really helpful. Um, and, you know, he, uh, he's been out there uh, uh, attempting to talk about uh, all the issues that are really going on and stating that, like, as the elites, we have to pursue something that is, uh, uh, sorry, I lost myself there. I'm going to back that up. He's out there trying to speak about what the elites are doing to us that is dangerous and asking for anybody out there in the scientific field to debate him and the people who are at the furthest edge of the field saying, we have all the science, refuse to debate him. And their answer is, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. The guy's written a book this thick, footnoted the whole way with their own papers. My point here is, again, when they shut down your debate, it means they have nothing to say, which means you need to push harder, not slow down. It's not the time to be quiet when they shut down your debate. It doesn't mean you have to debate them anymore. Go somewhere else. It means someone else will listen. If they won't, somebody else will. Uh, so, um, I've said this already. I'm going to skip that. Uh, let's, let's do more of this. Psychological warfare, then. You know, the, the game that's being played all the time by everyone right now with their stories is about capturing and repurposing symbols. All of us think in symbols. All of us think in pictures to some level because words ultimately come down to the letters which form the pictures. I'm not trying to make some statement about there not being truth or, or claim any postmodern language theory or anything like that. But what I am saying is if someone can figure that out, that this one noise we make, I used water earlier, so I'll just use it again, water. It's the noise I made, water, right? But it references something else in the world that in your head you kind of attach to that. If I can take that word and very slowly over 10 or 15 years inject a new meaning into that word just through saying it over and over again, you know, in cartoons and on, on commercials for, for uh, cereal and stuff like that, well then by the time everyone's 25 that was five when they're watching this, now, water doesn't mean what it used to mean. It means whatever I told them it means. So I can get you over time, if you'll just watch my show, to change your mind about anything just because you're watching my show. Why do I do YouTube stuff? Because I know that's true, and I think Christianity ought to get out there and yell a lot, frankly. Um, but I also think that the, the machine itself is pretty wicked. And if you've watched my message in the last few years, it's largely get off of it if you can. Get as little of it in your life as you can. Don't eat it. It's a publishing machine. Publish, but don't eat. Don't eat what the pagans sell. That's gross food. Um, here's one of the things they, that kind of proves this to me, too. Like, what they are doing is they are programming men to fear each other more and more, particularly men who don't look like you. I'll put it in real clear terms. White guys are afraid of black guys. Black guys are afraid of white guys. Brown guys are somewhere in the middle, and it depends. But all of us are a little more afraid of each other as men than they would have been in the 50s, even when there was real racism going on. 
they would have still just been walking around like men. And we're all terrified. Why is that? What happened to our testosterone levels? Now, what's going on? I think it can be clearly said that the U.S. government is not our friend, and we have to start thinking about operating in, a, in, in resistance to their story, right? This does not mean we cease to be involved in the political process. Lutherans aren't involved in the political process enough to begin with. It means getting more involved in the political process. It means recognizing that even when you carry the sword, the sword is a great danger to you. And it means if you're not going to carry the sword, and you're living in Babylon, and Babylon goes to war against Persia, well, then you might just get conquered in the next 10 years, and you probably should be ready for it. That's, that's the way I play it, right? I look at both ends. So at the moment, my pastoral care, like leadership program, has on the one end, actual alien invasion, zombie apocalypse, what's my plan? On the other end, nothing happens, and it's exactly like today, tomorrow, for the next 40 years. And every decision I want to make in God, in the Word, is somewhere between those two things. I think the idea that the U.S. government could actually have some blowback for our bioweapons development overseas is not that far of a stretch, frankly. Now, they're finding bioweapons in Ukraine. Maybe it's not true. I don't know. But if you do wicked stuff overseas long enough, eventually someone's going to come after you. We certainly have the issue of immigration and terrorism and violence in our cities and all these things uh, with all the fear of everything else going on. My favorite story, this is just for fun, I don't think I really believe this, but I did ask Dr. Kuntz about it on A Brief History of Power. I like to take the, the weirdest stuff to him. I mean, there are people out there right now who are convinced that there is a war going on between the U.S. government and an alien species underground Arizona since the 50s, and we're barely surviving. It's starship troopers, and that's why we need the immigration to get more fodder to throw out the monsters underneath. And they're all trying to get like little bits of adrenaline from your soul to suck on and eat weirdest stuff in the world. I like that stuff because it makes me think outside of my box with my theology, with my belief that Jesus has risen from the dead, that he has ascended, that he will return, that everything in the word is true. And so if there's an alien war beneath the streets of Phoenix, you know, well, Jesus is still king. And the first thing I'm going to do to an alien if he's talking is talk about Jesus with him. Rather than get blown off my game by this narrative out of movies that's supposed to make me scared and go buy like a, a generator or something, right? And I'm not saying don't buy a generator. But I am saying we have to think and pray like people who expect societal collapse to be possible and then know from studying societal collapse, go ahead and do it sometime. Spanish Civil War, Argentina 2001. Um, when it goes sideways, people die. Lots of people die. If what the U.S. government is doing right now doesn't work the way they want it to, or maybe if it does, I don't know which one, honestly, we're going to see a lot more death in the next 10 to 20 years than probably not. And we already are seeing that if you look at the numbers of all-cause mortality, they're up since 2021. Oh, why is that? I'm not going to try to answer that one for you. You can put your own pieces together. But expect that, let's say things really get rough with, say, electricity. The grid goes down for two weeks. Internet goes down for two weeks. You know what's gone? Water. Food. Two weeks. You got two weeks of food in your house? Do your people in your churches have two weeks? You got two weeks of food to give to the poor coming to your church? These are the kinds of things we should think about that don't need zombies or otherwise to make it kind of uh, common sense. Right, common sense, or it was common once. Um, so let's talk about planning, though. Uh, I think it was uh, Peter yesterday talked about urgency and living as if the world is about to end. And I'm, I'm totally with you. Uh, but I want to caveat just a touch because I want to have two options for tomorrow every day. Uh, one of those options is tomorrow morning I wake up and I don't, every morning when I wake up it's like, uh, you know, like this, right? Um, tomorrow morning is going to be, I spring out of bed because I'm glowing with the light that streams from Jesus Christ. My resurrected body is so complete that I just don't, I, wow, it's a good day. That's tomorrow morning for me. I want to live my entire day today as if that's completely true and I should assume it's true. At the same time, I'm going to also assume he might not come back for a thousand years or more. And so if I'm going to make a decision that's not about today, today gets priority always, then my decision is going to be about after I'm dead. I'm not planning for 30 years, I'm not planning for 60 years, I'm not planning for 10 years, I'm planning for today, and I'm planning for 500 years from now. Everything I do, that is my approach theologically as a framework now. 
I found it very beneficial because the urgency goes up and yet I can still plan. I can still think and it makes me think about my kids. It makes me think about my grandkids, right? It makes me think about things that endure. It makes me not buy stuff at Walmart anymore because it just falls apart. Instead, I want to buy something I can hand on if possible. Oh, maybe some land, right? Uh, and that kind of thing. So we have two options. He returns soon or he returns a long time from now. Um, either we're at the end or we have a very long time left. I already mentioned the zombies. This card's a little out of place. But I think this is really worth co- considering. If anyone's, if, you, if you've never read uh, Nassim Talib, uh, pastors particularly, I highly recommend his Skin in the Game. It's an excellent, excellent book on mathematical philosophy and uh, how to care, I think, is what it's about. But he does a lot as a mathematician uh, with proofs and probabilities. And he makes this statement as a Christian, Palestinian Christian, Eastern Christian, I think Syrian maybe. So he's not really working with Christian theology. It might be a pagan idea. I don't know. But it's a mathematical prospect, which is that if you can imagine it as a human being, it's possible in reality. Now, that's his mathematical prospect again. He can prove that with a formula, and so you have to agree because it's math. Now, I, I haven't seen the formula, and I don't think that way with math, but I think his postulate is fascinating. If we can imagine it, it's possible. Unicorns, that's fun, right? Dinosaurs, <laughs> that's fun too, right? Uh, what about those zombies? What about those aliens? Uh, what about things going on as they have from the beginning, but being in Noah's day, where there's nothing new under the sun, but we have these iPhones, How's it all go together? What's the real future look like? And that's why it is speculation. You just have today. Whatever I might be able to say about what I think is coming, I'm I'm wrong most of the time about a lot of things. But what I know about today is that the word of God that is simple things like love your neighbor, or we were just talking in there a little while ago, you know, the brotherhood of friendship love in, in the scriptures, philos, uh, is about dying together in war. Right? Go live like you want to die with your family. Right? As opposed to like, like you just want to kind of waste time with them, right? So, I, okay, getting back to um, uh, societal collapse, I've made a number of, I would say, assumptive claims about that so far. So let me give you just a little bit more of some real history from that um, with this intro. I think if you take a step back and you read the Old Testament and the New Testament and then you were to look at our country as an alien of some kind but able to understand, uh, you would have to see the ubiquitousness of porn transsexuality, homosexuality, college co-ed, polyamory, and abortion as a clear sign of the judgment of God upon us as a nation, hardening us unto our self-destruction. I'm going to say it again, okay? The ubiquitousness of porn, trans, homosexuality, cohabitation, uh, uh, polyamory, abortion, is a sign of the judgment of God hardening our country unto self-destruction. If we do not repent, we will destroy ourselves. It's the only way it ever happens, over and over again. Which isn't a reason to run around like Chicken Little, scared to death. It's a reason to be ready. Be ready to tell somebody who thinks the world's falling down that Jesus is coming back, and that's why you're not afraid, even though you've got to go pick up a shotgun and fight zombies. Or whatever. Whatever. Now, here's again, Argentina, 2001. No, that's amazing we don't know this. I can't believe it wasn't on TV when, when uh, 2000s came around. Argentina was a first world country until 2001, richer than America by far, median income and so forth. People traveled here for vacation because it was cheap to come here from Argentina. Uh, A large percentage of the population starved to death over several months when the the currency collapsed to zero uh, due to, uh, let's just call it uh, modern finance theory, something like that. Um, Anarchy and violent survival reigned in the suburbs for a full month. Put yourself in any city suburb. Imagine the currency goes to zero because who knows? There's plenty of reasons why it could. Uh, And a full month of survival, food, fighting, people dying and taking. And this isn't a bunch of Christians right now. It was Christians in Argentina. Uh, But it turned into, again, a, a total destructive fest of fighting. Your plastic doesn't work anymore. Real cash 
real cash, which is worth zero, is actually still worth something because no one has any of it. The banks will let it out. You've got to surf for the, or you've got to search for the ATM. Um, uh, the capital city did not fall. Wealth stays wealthy, even when they're looting. Yeah. Um, but there were children starving to death due to the zero currency um, and anarchy reigning. Yeah. Um, the Neos Distertian Times, uh, which is a, a substack by a very intelligent, unnamed person, uh, talks about societal collapse in this way. It says, the principles of societal collapse are universal in their application, but they always have a variation on the theme. They always have the same principle, though, right? So people want to say, are we Rome right now? Or are we Persia right now? Or are we blah, 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 blah? The catalyst for every society's collapse is complexity complexity. It becomes too complicated to maintain. The linear progression of always getting better and more efficient is just a myth. And it doesn't make things more efficient, it makes them more complex until they break down. Fallen societies don't disappear but reemerge as second generation states. Uh, we can put this in a biblical framework by just thinking about the Babel idea, right? That whenever man gets together to build something, he will inevitably be driven by his greed. That will inevitably drive him to malice, which will calcify and make him unable to understand what his neighbor is saying, even if his neighbor is trying to help him. And so men will be set against each other by their tongues for the sake of their pride and their desire to build their kingdoms. Huh? The Babel principle. As Christians, we have the antidote to this in Pentecost, and I would say in the New Testament gospel of Scripture itself. Uh, that scripture is something that's an antidote to Babel, rightly translated. When you read the Bible as a people together in the same translation, you have a common tongue. Whereas the rest of the world right now is getting different tongues. Mom's got a tongue, dad's got a tongue, kids got a tongue. They're all in a diff different channel, in a different chat room, in a different place with different movies and different music. And they come together at the table and no one knows who anybody is because they don't even use the same words. Do you see it's not a new game. Do you see it's the hardening of man against his own unrepentance? And that the church doesn't have to go along for the ride. But we did. We did. I think we're not all the time. That's why conferences like this are still continuing to meet. We want to ask questions. What can we do? Right? A crisis is an opportunity for a new start. And in that way, the crisis of 2020 has been an opportunity for Christians and churches all over the country to realize that if somebody else isn't doing something about what needs to be done, well then, by golly, we should do something about it. And one of the greatest pleasures I've had, and as I've traveled, talked, people call to ask about what's going on in Rockford, is I get to hear about how while the world is getting wickeder and wickeder to the level where it like stinks to walk around in certain places, the churches that have remembered the Bible is the heartbeat of our life together, they're all saying the same thing. God's moving in our midst. He's working here to build now. Let's be less afraid together. I find that very, very encouraging myself where I am. Um, skip that one here. Okay, skip that one here. Okay, we're going to shift tone. What's my time? Good. So that's all the bad news, which if I am going to talk to you about integrity, I have to have all that on the table before I can talk about, like, how does the ACALC become an organization of integrity in this time and place? It's like, well, you've got to tell the LCMS they should deal with some of those things I just talked about, along with whatever was going on in 20, what was it, 13, 20, 2015 when you started, Right? Um, those things aren't wrong. I, I actually think that the, uh, the, the loudest one is the treatment of men without calls, uh, the men who have been blackballed. Um, that issue has been there uh, for so long, and I have friends who end up, you know, they, they make one mistake, and it's just like they're out. And sometimes it is their own fault, but at the same time, the system is, is not built to help them. And so, so to confront that directly, I, I, mean, I would just make that the loudest thing you say ever as ACELC. Like, you exist to fix that, and after that's done, you can fix some other stuff. But that one, I don't know who could be against that at the end of the day. Like, who's against helping the guys who got blackballed? Just talk that way, <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, to have integrity, the ACELC as an institution began before 2020 must realize we're after 2020, and that all institutions that don't realize that are going to crash. They're done. 
Financially, they're done. They're going to tie themselves to the dollar. They can't imagine a financial collapse, and so they will collapse when the dollar collapses. To not do that is to say, well, maybe the dollar will still be here, but we need a secondary way of thinking, which doesn't mean cryptocurrency, although it could, but it just means a little bit more actually trust in God. I mean, think about all the attempts we've made to build these like um, uh, uh, endowment systems. If we go to a World Bank digital currency where they repeg the dollar, like that's all just gone now. Or it's only good for certain things. What they want to do with the central bank digital currency, this is the digital dollar that they're going to kind of try to bring out through the World Bank or whatever. What they really want to do is you can have all the dollars in the bank you want, but if you bought too much meat or gasoline this week, you can't buy anymore. Because it's died to your account. You don't earn the money, you earn the right to buy certain things sometimes. That's the game plan of the WEF. It's on their website. You can see it. I don't know if they'll succeed. I'm getting ready for that world, though. I'm expecting it to come. I'm getting to know local farmers who like to trade in kind. Why not? They want us to eat bugs, some people say, right? I like cow. Yeah. So, point being, integrity means taking a real solid vesture of what's around you individually without all the other stories from the TV forming it first. Let the Bible form it first. And then, kind of dismissing the stories from the TV with like a 20% truth grain to all of them, striving to do something that is real and is in front of you. If I type about how this person did a bad thing somewhere or somewhere and we should do something, I, it's just a waste of my life. But if I have a conversation with somebody who lives next door to me about the very same issue over three hours, I might just convert them to my way, right? Integrity. It means not just saying, I think this. It means doing this. So here, let me go in a whole new direction with something that the LCMS, if it wants integrity, needs back. And I, don't, I can't speak for the ACELC, but I, I can speak for myself. That's this. Optimism is mandatory because it's a doctrine that we confess in the confessions. We call it election, which makes it hard to understand because we have to talk about paradoxes and you know, a predestination, all this kind of stuff. That's all fine if you're dealing with a Calvinist who doesn't believe in that stuff. But when you're dealing with like normal people, all we really need to know is that election means it's all going to be good. Always. Like the worst possible thing you can imagine is good now because he died and rose again. Period. You put yourself in the worst possible place you can imagine and ask yourself, will I feel like it's good when I'm there? And if your answer is no, then say, I got some discipline to work on now, don't I? Because I don't want to, I don't want to be in that place where they throw me in a cell and I start to doubt. Not after talking like this for all these years. No way. No, when I get thrown in a cell, I want to be stronger for it. I want to say, this proves it now. Now my inheritance is great. Right? I don't want to sell, believe me. I'd like to die quietly near my lake. I really would. Um, but optimism is mandatory. And so I have to believe that if the government's stupid enough to put me in jail, I'm going to come out with 300 converted sons of Solomon. I'm going to spend all day, every day in the chapel talking about Jesus with people. If they really want to do that to me, that's what they're going to do. Optimism is mandated, though. I must believe that if someone shows up at my door from the CIA and says, you might be a terrorist because you do this show with this other guy, and they're connected to some people by extended accounts, and one time on Twitter somebody said something, I'm going to say, do you know Jesus Christ? Come on in, let me talk. I really do want to convert anybody who comes my way to believing in Jesus Christ. I think that's the antidote to fear. And I've seen it work in my own life, like directly one-to-one -one with the man shouting at me. It was I, I, I don't want to tell the whole story, but it blows me away. Three times, do you know Jesus? I asked him. He said other stuff. The third time, he started to preach Moses to me. I mean, you theologians, put that in your hopper. I'm saying, do you know Jesus? He talks Moses. I mean, if the devil ain't in that one, where is he, you know? Uh, optimism is mandated. That means you got to learn to love to surf. Learn to love to surf. Surfing, you can't control the wave. You got to catch the wave. You got to kind of let the wave catch you, right? Uh, this is what it's like to love a woman. She's not going to be the same every day, guys. She's going to change all the time. It's going to come, it's going to go, and you're going to be like, ah, until you learn to surf. You've got to learn to ride those emotions and then lift her up toward the good ones and care for her in the weak ones, yeah? Uh, and then the same is just true for pastoral ministry. 
Someone's going to come into your office, they're going to scream their head off about something that's like, you know, I don't know, you, you, you forgot their special individual cup this week or, or something, something like that, right? And it's actually about how her granddaughter's going trans. Right? You know how this is, right? You got to love to surf. You got to see it coming like it's a fight. You roll with the punches and you keep going because optimism is mandatory. You can't lose. You're more than conqueror every time. Not a single thing is going to go wrong. But if when it's going wrong, you think it's going wrong, you won't see the right. So your weapon here is your mind and the story you tell your mind every single day. So are you telling your mind that you have to escape the world? And again, look at what you do when you're done with work. Because if your body is trying to escape the world, then that's the story you're telling your mind. One that needs escape. Know your enemy and his tools, their words, and know the mediums, the witches, the storytelling machines uh, that bring these words of irreverence and irreverence to you daily. Prepare to raise your own family as somebody different. Prepare to make a team with a common language that isn't what others say. Improve your local network. Get to know the other clergy in your neighborhood. Are they pro-life? Then your friends. Huh? Create space between uh, the chaos of the world and the chaos of people's lives with the sanctuary being a, a place of peace and calm. Right? Come to church as a pastor, guys. Not to be afraid, but to give dignity to those who are afraid, saying to them again, it can't go wrong. God will turn it around. He has a plan. Those are all just the facts. And here's one that we don't say because the Baptists say it, for such a time as this. How many times are we going to let the Baptists take away our good talk from the Bible because they do it wrong? I'm on a a full-on mission to take that back. For such a time as this, Lutherans, we must repent of being a denomination and fighting with the other denominations as if we're on the same footing as them. We are the reformation of the Catholic Church. We are not a church body. We are not here to sit on our laurels. We are not here to restore Luther's church. We are here to tell the Pope he needs to call a council that includes the East and includes the Baptists and the Charismatics and the Oneness Pentecostals. Why not? Let's go back to Nicaea and fix the whole thing to Constantinople. We'll get the East back on side. If we can't get the Philoque done, at least we'll all be united against the Pope. That's where I want to go now. Not just trying to take back the Purple Palace. It's just going to get sold, everybody. We're just going to sell it in 20 years. While our biblical illiteracy amongst the people completely takes away our capacity to tell the gospel to others. Most of our people can't talk about Jesus. They might be able to say law gospel. They could say it, law gospel, right? But but then what is this gospel? And that I could say the gospel is that I live a victorious life in Christ. See, I'm not allowed to say that now, right? Because why? The Baptists say it wrong. But see, the Bible says it right. We have tied our hands and now we're getting beaten. And all I want is for us to have a little more optimism. Trust the word of God. Trust the seed to be scattered. Do, what was the one argument that we were talking about just uh, uh, yesterday? I heard, like, so I'll use myself as an example. Let's say I get invited to go talk at, at some, like, I don't know, literally oneness Pentecostal place, right? So, Benny Hinn, he's throwing, throwing people on the stage, but he likes my show. So he wants me to come talk about marriage. Am I allowed to go, LCMS? I say, yes, I better go. I better go and I better speak truth. I better speak hard truth into that room and not hold back at all because I'm there to scatter the seed. I'm not in fellowship with people just because I scattered seed at them. (laughs) I'm scattering seed at the people who need it. And we have to recapture that. It's one thing to bring them into your pulpit. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. It's another thing to go infiltrate theirs. Uh, The Christian way is revolutionary. It sets you free where you are today to testify of what you know God has said with such certainty that nothing can tell you no. Christianity is the revolutionary idea then that every human being has dignity and thus the pro-life message, life is a gift, becomes very much who we have always been. The reason we had a pro-life country is because of Christianity, not for any other religion's sake. Uh, and uh, this is, is so obvious that we used to call Western civilization Christendom. Uh, but now, again, we've watched them remove Christ, and we're watching the results of that. 
Um, if you haven't heard of the Magdeburg Confession, it's one that's worth doing a little study on. This is one of the Lutheran confessions that's not in our uh, Book of Concord of 1580, so we do not subscribe to it, uh, quia. But it is a historical document out of the Reformation time period where uh, a Lutheran city called Magdeburg decided not to submit to something called the Augsburg Interim, which was the Pope using the sword to make the Lutherans Catholic again. They won the battle at the war, and they had control. Some of this is, is what leads to Walther and the others coming overseas. Um, but Magdeburg is a city that decides to resist. The, the leaders of the city decide that the emperor doesn't have a right to tell us what to do with our religion, and they, they get in a war. They get surrounded, actually. Um, and uh, the history of it is, is sad that they get sold out by their prince, actually. Um, but uh, the theology of it is very important. Um, and that's this, because uh, they, they had to study this. Everyone's telling them you're not allowed to resist, right? Romans 13, come on. Uh, scripture does not mandate that you tolerate evil. Scripture does not mandate that you accept betrayal. Scripture does not mandate that you be timid or advocate wicked things. And the fourth commandment, not only is the commandment to submit to order from above, but to use the authority you have to protect those below from the tyranny above. That's huge right there. Magdeburg. Uh, I'll skip that one. So, the challenge, uh, if I can put it in clear terms again, you know, the, the state of our lack of integrity as the Missouri Synod is there's effectively a regulatory capture of the LCMS by the U.S. government's narrative that's almost unavoidable in the petrodollar now. It doesn't have to be unavoidable, and you can wake up to the fact that that little picture on your dollar bill is what an idol is. It's the definition of Old Testament idol. The picture on the money is the idol, right? Um, it's the story of that picture that matters. It's not that you use it to buy your gas. Who cares? You know, it's, it, uh, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but it's his idol, right? And so uh, to see that, to believe that, that idol, that story about the dollar has captured our structures, our bureaucracies, rule by the desk, uh, is imperative if we're going to repent of it. I don't think that means getting people in office or out of office. I think it means everybody's got to repent of it. We just, we trust too much in the dollar to be here in 40 years. We, we uh, guys, cynically, we laugh about how what holds us together is the healthcare system. Well, that's vapor and smoke, you know? Uh, so we, to have integrity, we got to start living like today is today. The end of the world could be tomorrow. Who cares about the health plan? I'm glad for the people who work in that system. I'm glad for my retirement package. I don't want to throw it away, but it's not the story I live by. And we as a body, praise and worship people, liturgy people, uh, we want more schools, we don't want schools, homeschool people, we all have to come back to this, that we want to be in a system where our narrative is not Captain America, but our narrative is Jesus is risen and coming back very soon. Um, skip that um, idolatry then I think David said uh, the perfect is the enemy of the good or maybe that was Peter again you both said some similar things um, and uh, when I gave you that list David of, uh, uh, of all the things from the Psalms that a pure heart does um, you, you pulled out idolatry off the top and indeed uh, John's final word in his epistle has been on my conscience for a while now little little children keep yourselves from idols and the fact that as a modern american lutheran i effectively had assumed there's no such thing anymore i mean obviously we all have idols in our hearts right but no actual idols and then i realized i had this giant thing set up on my wall that i sat down before every day and stared at for hours at a time and it in fact was a talking picture and then i read isaiah and he says they do not talk and i'm like now they do now, you're a Christian, so let me suggest to you the idol of your TV can't dissolve your relationship with Christ, but let me also suggest that everybody who's not a Christian is worshiping their TV and can't not. Because idolatry is the only way. It's all worship all the time. And idolatry is then also tight, tightly connected to ideology, platonic thinking, thinking in the future. It will be like this, and we will make it so, and it's not today, it's not real. I will go. 
Deo volente, if God wills it, you will go, right? Idolatry and idealism. Uh, This is where you see the woke idolatry is in their ideals, which are pictures of things that can't actually be. I'm a cat. I decided to be a cat. Cut off my body parts and give me fur, right? Idolatry, a picture they're trying to worship. Uh, So, for my part here, um, I, optimism being mandated tells me that I want to repent publicly of just being too hard on the heterodox. I think the heterodox need to repent. I don't like when people say things the Bible doesn't say. Um, but what I'm really thankful for is the guys in my town who preached Christ uh, even in the face of having their churches closed by by authorities, um, or by uh, their elders, or things like that. Um, I'm really grateful uh, that there are individuals out there publicly right now, loud voices, saying things about Jesus Christ, even though like none of them are Lutherans. Like the Lutheran voices are not loud, uh, but there are other political figures and one that they'll talk about Christ. Um, I'm really encouraged that. All the Christians I'm meeting in Rockford, no matter what denomination they're from, they're all like, the Spirit wants us to go back to the Bible more. I'm like, yes, this is true, right? Optimism. God's watering the church under our noses. Would that you seized it and reigned with it now. They're waiting for us. They're waiting for us to lead. But we can't walk in and lead with words they don't understand. We must find ways to speak to Americans what Lutherans mean in the Bible's talk. By not having our own translation, we're way late to the game, right? But again, uh, do, I talk about, do I talk about how Jesus justified you to my, my blue-collar, illiterate, 25-year-old dock worker? Or do I tell him, it's all good, Jesus got you? Is there a difference? And I'm going to say, no, there's not. Not for his heart and his faith at that moment. It was the gospel. And all of our opining about law and gospel doesn't do us any good if we're trapped in vocabulary people can't hear. Uh, so, um, if your hair is on fire <laughs> about the large catechism, I don't disagree with the criticisms of it. But I think if your hair is on fire about the large catechism and your kids are watching TikTok and your Netflix queue is full, then you got bigger problems. We're distracted. Um, If I have to have somebody read a book so that they can know what's wrong, so that I can tell them why I'm right, I'm never going to get a hearing. Not today. I have to be able to tell them what I believe is right as upright right away. That's integrity. And because of the sales pitch nature of our culture, people can sniff it. You come up and you hem and haw and you're not so sure. I mean, I'm so sick of having shame about inviting people to church. This has been something that chased me my whole life. It's like, I meet somebody at, 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 uh, at Starbucks and they find out I'm a pastor and I immediately get a little nervous. It's kind of like, oh, you know, yeah, I have a church. It's a Lutheran church and we're kind of the weird ones over there outside of town. Like that, that fear, well, no one's going to go to your church then. That's me. Again, I got to confess that. I got to repent of that and be a little bit more like, you should come to my church. My church is the coolest church in town. We have the true gospel. We read the actual Bible there. God's body is one with us at all times, and we're going to live forever. You got that at your church? A lot of churches don't. They don't. All they got is like stewardship programs and stuff, right? So, all right. Last thing. I still got five minutes, right? Where'd he go? I saw him. Yeah, five minutes. Last thing. I'm going to try to sell you all to become sons of Solomon. Or daughters of wisdom, if you like. Uh, Sons of Solomon is a a game. It's a guess. It's a gambit. It's a prayer. It is my attempt, 2020, to take everything I've learned from the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod as a son of the synod that was in another church system for a long time as I came back into Christianity through them, but now I'm a pastor here. It's my attempt to take everything we have in our beautiful small catechism of Dr. Luther and turn it into something that you can give to any Catholic, any Baptist, any Hindu, any Lutheran, and have them work toward unity of mind in Christ immediately and forever. 
That's a bold claim. So I challenge you, test me. This is not just developed in a corner accidentally. It not only builds upon the principle of the fourth commandment, the patriarch principle is what it's called in here, uh, as something that is necessary for young men to rediscover manhood and leadership and all these kinds of things, but more important than anything else, this is a tract to convince everyone to pray the Psalms in Jesus' name and read the Proverbs more often. Because it's just a fact that if all Christian men all around the world pray the Psalms in Jesus' name and read the Proverbs every day, it's going to get better than it is now. Promise you. You just take me to the bank. Dare you. Do it. Let's all do it. It will change the world. And I tell you, you get the Baptists doing this down the street. You get the Catholics doing this down the street. We're all learning the same word of God all the time. We are going to have a common tongue with which to fight back against the enemy. Now, there's, more, there's a bunch of these up here. We're almost out. It's the third printing of the Sons of Solomon. We give them away for free. Sonsofsolomon.net. We'll mail them to you. Um, there's also Daughters of Wisdom down there. The Sons of Solomon ones are almost gone, so don't take too many of those. Take as many Daughters of Wisdom ones as you like. Again, to give you the idea, what, what men are missing, forgive me, but it's a relationship with Jesus Christ is what men in the LCMS are missing. Okay. We're missing a relationship with Jesus Christ. And by that, I don't mean I gave my heart to him in a decision at an altar call. What I mean is daily I call upon him. Daily I say his name out loud. Daily I cry to him and know that he will hear my voice and answer my prayers. And nothing will teach you that faster than praying the Psalms. Nothing will teach you that faster. You're going to be blown away. That Psalm is what I needed to pray for. Oh, I prayed for that. It happened. It's just the way the Psalms work. And so to take several Psalms as a catechism, of its own right, and convince all the men that we can to pray those same psalms in Jesus' name together is to make us a united voice. And of course, right after those psalms, I do got the catechism back in here, not the copyrighted version. That would be illegal. <laughs> not that I care that much. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I want them to make it legal. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, ponder a proverb daily. Uh, this has been going on for three years now uh, as a dispersed idea. Uh, let me try to sell it to you a different way. Can you imagine what would happen if Lutherans became Antifa? Or maybe if all of Antifa converted to Lutheranism for sure. How would that work? Or can you imagine if Lutherans operated like Navy SEALs? It's called dispersed authority networks. It's a philosophy or a, a governmental structure or how to build things. That's also in here. Because what this really is is a chance to restart the LLL just by getting people to pray the same prayers. And I promise it will work because it's built on the principle of the Word of God. So, what can you do today if nothing else? If I haven't inspired you to do anything else and you aren't doing this yet, I want you to take Psalm 125 and pray it tomorrow morning and then pray it the morning after that and then pray it the morning after that and not stop until you're praying more Psalms than just that every day. Because there is nothing like praising God to stem the tide of darkness around you. And there is nothing like lifting up the voice of Jesus Christ on your lips to give you courage and strength in a moment of trial and terror. We need men to stand up and say, follow me, let's pray. So again, if there are no good men around you, become one. Sons of Solomon is a great way to start a men's group at your church too. It's really easy. Get two guys, pray the Psalms together, meet once a month, have some dinner, talk about the Bible. Over time... Your study of the Psalms and Proverbs will make you a man who stands in the face of evil. That's your baptism. This isn't me saying if, then, or do some works, or justified by works. We're all saved. We're all alive now. Let's be disciples together. Blessed are the integral in the way they walk in the Torah of Jesus Christ. That's Psalm 119, verse 1. Whoever walks integrally will be saved. He who is perverse and twisted will fall. Proverbs 28, 18. Have you seen Job? There's none like him, integral and upright. And his wife, remember this? Job, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Psalm 7. Can Lutherans say this? Judge me, O Jesus Christ, according to my righteousness, according to my integrity. Uh, Psalm 4, verse 1 does point out it is Christ's righteousness that is my righteousness. Proverbs 2, 21 and 22. The upright will dwell in the land, and those of integrity will remain, but the wicked will be cut off. 
Uh, Psalm 26, judge me, Jesus Christ, in my integrity, for I have walked. In Jesus Christ I have trusted, I did not slip, and I in my integrity will walk. Purchase me and favor me. Life is a public matter, which makes doctrine a public matter. Doctrine is not a platonic theory about what God might be like or how God thinks or what it means when He does this or that. Uh, Doctrine and life is the Holy Spirit of the living God, the Creator, who breathed the air into these clay shells in the first place, and who even after we fell, rebelling against Him, still thought we were good in the sense that He made us, we're His, And honestly, he was going to be damned if he was going to let anybody take it from us. And so he did. He got damned. And he took it right back. That spirit now who anointed Christ to do this for us is breathed from him into our hearts. I mean, take a step back and think about it. You are possessed. You're possessed. We talk about the demons that way, even though we don't believe in the demons anymore, that they would possess them. And the Holy Spirit has said he possesses you. So if you're like, oh, I don't feel like it very much, repent. Repent. And ask him to wake you up. James, great book. Ask for wisdom. He always says yes. Thank you for letting me talk as long as I did. I tried to tie a lot of things together. I'm looking forward to your questions. I hope I can clarify what was confusing. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Fisk. Um, We're going to go to break. Um, If you didn't have any questions for the panel, you probably